prevail in Jesus only victory when I am poor you stand in the door and sing praises over me the gates of hell shall
God, for all that you are to us. God, all that you do, Lord, we don't deserve it, Lord. While we were still sinners, you died for us, God. May that be the sweet, the sweet truth, God, that we latch on to today, God. That your forgiveness of our sins, God, had nothing to do with us, but everything to do with you, because you are good. And we love you, God. We praise you. It's in your precious name. Amen. <clears throat> well, we've started by worshiping Jesus. That's where we start, isn't it? It's where it all starts. If I want to know him, I come to know him through worshiping him. Very important part of the Christian life. Very big part of experiencing and encountering God is through worship. And so we thank God for that this morning. Well, guys, we are in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, picking up in verse 34 to the end of the first chapter. It only took us three weeks to get through chapter 1. There's so much there. Just can't blow through God's holy word. So if you need a Bible this morning, raise your hand, and Usher would love to put one in your hand so that you can follow along through God's holy word with us this morning. The message this morning is encountering Jesus. And I hope, it's my prayer, that each one of us had had that encountering moment where we've encountered Christ. And yet, day by day, even hour or moment by moment, we are still, as children of God, experiencing or encountering God. Through His Word, through the fellowship of saints, through times of worship, through, well, even hardship, right? Right? Valleys, as well as hilltop experiences, we are encountering the Lord. I think about our Messiah and how he's been encountered. The Messiah, he arrived with the name given Jesus. And people have been encountering him since birth. We can go back to the wise men and how they encountered Jesus there in the stable. Or Anna and Simeon. They're just days after the birth of Jesus. He, they encountered him there at the temple. Or how about the encounter the scholars had in the synagogue with the, the young child Jesus when he was just blowing their minds. He just, here he is about 12 years old and he's, he's teaching them. <laughs> we see an interesting encounter between Jesus and Satan shortly after or, or what followed his baptism. Before his arrival into Galilee, where he calls the disciples, there is this encounter where Satan tempts Jesus with all the world has to offer. Let's go ahead and read our passage this morning. Here in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, picking up in verse 35. John begins by saying, again, the next day, John, that's the Baptist, with two of his disciples, they, they, they stood. And looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And then Jesus turned, seeing them following, said to them, what do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say, then, translated teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come see. And they came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. Let's just stop right there. We'll pick up the second half of, or the, the, the last portion of this chapter, the second half of today's message uh, in a little bit. So here we have Jesus having another interesting encounter after his baptism, after his temptation, and after these two disciples here, 
these two disciples, they choose to turn from following John, the Baptist, that is, and they turn to follow Jesus. This is before he arrived in Galilee and began to call his disciples there in Galilee. On his way, I believe that Jesus swung by Nazareth, his home. This has a lot to do with the passage this morning. So if you would, turn to Luke 4, holding your place in John. Just the next gospel over. Chapter 4, verse 14. Gospel backwards. <laughs> the previous gospel. Chapter 4, verse 14. Jesus begins his Galilean ministry. And then Jesus, verse 14, returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. Now Nazareth is considered the region of Galilee, although it's up into the hill country. And news of him went out through all the surrounding region. And he taught in their synagogue, being glorified by all. Now, <clears throat> We're going to finish reading the, the, this chapter 4. If you go back down and you look at, well, after what he had said in the previous verses, 28, 29, and 30, they take him to what they call in, in Nazareth, in Israel, the Mount Precipitous. And this is the region or the area in which they believe that they, here in this experience, they went to throw Jesus, after teaching in the synagogue, throw him off a cliff. So uh, when, when Luke says that here he was glorified by all, um, uh, I, that, and he wasn't glorified by everybody. <laughs> Some people wanted to throw him off a cliff. So, it's verse 16. So Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Listen, this is this is a direct quote from Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he closed the book, he gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed upon him. He began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So, all bore witness of him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? Remember, he, he's in Nazareth, right? Let's go back and go back to John, where you're holding your place. I read all that for clarity as we begin to go down through. What an encounter here that Jesus has in his own hometown. And this helps us understand the encounter Jesus has with these first disciples here in John, the last half of this chapter this morning. But I have a question for you. Have you encountered Jesus? And if so, you know that there's always a decision that has to be made when one encounters Jesus. And that's what we're going to see this morning. He begins in verse 35. Again, the next day. Refers to the second day in the sequence of events that we see here in chapter 1. What is important about the way that John describes the first of Jesus' disciples making a choice here to turn from John the Baptist and to follow Jesus is a big deal. I want to point out that John the Baptist, he has no ill feelings that his disciples no longer are following him, but turning from him and beginning to follow this Jesus. Mostly because these men didn't belong to John the Baptist. They truly belonged to Jesus. And, and I think that's something that we need to remember. We need to encounter Jesus. We do not need to encounter a man. I don't, I'm not looking for a prophet. How many people, how many people that fall under the banner of Christian are looking for a prophet? 
you got to come to my church. A lot of pastors call themselves prophet. Just scroll through YouTube. My pastor's a prophet. I, I'm not looking for a prophet. I've got a prophet. His name's Jesus. Okay. I don't belong to any. I belong to Jesus. The encounter I need to have is with Jesus. And what's profound is that's exactly what John the Baptist's ministry was. Not to hold on to these men, but to proclaim Jesus. That behold the Lamb of God. The sacrificial work of God Almighty. Look. Follow him. He's encouraging these men to look as he walks by. As they're standing there, and Jesus just happens to be walking by John the Baptist. Now, he, he gets all of their attention on Jesus. It now shifts from, from my attention and from my message of water baptism now to the sacrificial work of God. Look at him as he walks by. That's powerful. And as John here is standing with Andrew and this other disciple, I believe it's the gospel writer here. We know that it's Andrew from verse 40, but we're not exactly told who this other disciple is with Andrew. But there's a couple reasons why I believe it's John, the author. One, the author has a way of not mentioning himself in, um, throughout the, his gospel. But we see as they are standing there, they're gazing at Jesus as he walked by. Were they standing beside John and pondering in silence? Or were they having a deep discussion regarding exactly who Jesus was? There are times to ponder, to consider. And there's times to have those deep conversations. But there was given attention to every detail in the very moment. Great thought being uh, processed as they once again heard the words of John. Behold, the Lamb of God. Again, Wolverd Wolver said this regarding this statement here, this, this verse here. The action of God's economy was shifting, he said, from John the Baptist to the ministry of Jesus. We see a shift. Jesus is greater than this John. Again, he's purposely pointing his disciples to Jesus, and they are about to follow Jesus, and their lives will never be the same. Jesus would accomplish in their life what the prophet John the Baptist would not be able to accomplish. John the Baptist was not that sacrificial lamb. We saw that in the beginning of this chapter. And, G and John the Baptist, he'd already made this reference to Jesus as being the Lamb of God <clears throat> in verse 29 of chapter 1. And perhaps by this time, it wasn't just a statement, but now a big part of his message. It became the closing point to everything that he had to say. It's, it's as if, as we read the passage, that, that every time he was going to proclaim Christ, he would finish up with, Behold, the Lamb of God, that sacrificial lamb that takes away the sin of the world. To preach the gospel and to leave this simple notion out is a false gospel. But think about how this meant to Israel. Right? Once a year, the high priest would go in and make atonement for the people. Right? Offering up a blood sacrifice. But often, throughout feasts, they would bring a lamb without spot or blemish. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. This is clear. He's the sacrificial lamb. He's the Messiah. And it says they followed Jesus. And the term here, followed, I believe has two meanings. And it has two meanings for us today. One, that, that there, that hour, 
They literally followed Jesus. I mean, they just, he began to, he was walking by and they were standing with John and, and then they weren't standing with John anymore. They were like following Jesus, walking with him. We need to do that. I mean, there's this, there's this, there's this part of like a, an actual physical, a literal walk with Jesus. I see myself walking with Jesus. When, when I'm praying to Jesus, I mean, I'm physically, I'm, I'm literally praying to Jesus. It's, yeah, it's not symbolic. I'm, I'm walking with Jesus. I'm, I'm praying with Jesus as if I was here 2,000 years ago. I'm encountering Jesus. But secondly, they also follow Jesus as his disciples. He now becomes their teacher. Their allegiance was to Jesus from that moment on. So there's a spiritual following. Not just a physical following. And it all happens at John the Baptist's blessing. And when all this happens, Jesus, being the good leader that he is, I hear feet, people following me. He just simply, while he's, I don't think Jesus stopped walking. I think he just continued to walk. And as he looked behind him at these two following him, Andrew and possibly John, the author of this gospel, he asked them a question. What do you seek? What, why are you following me? This is the question that even Christians today should be asking themselves. And this clearly speaks of more than just simply walking down a road with Jesus. And the truth be told, that's all that many of us are doing. Jesus asked this question of all of us. What do you seek? These are the first words as now brand new followers of Jesus. They've, I mean, they've, they've heard Jesus speak. I'm not saying they hadn't heard words come out of his mouth. Or, or that they weren't there at his baptism when they saw, right, the Spirit descending upon him like a dove and the voice of the Father. But, but here now, as followers of Jesus, the first thing they hear out of his mouth, what are you seeking? And the reply, where are you staying? So what does that imply to you? They wanted to know where he was going. They wanted to know what, where he called home. They had made the decision, where are you going? Because that's where we're going. That's their answer. What are you seeking? I'm seeking to go wherever you go. <laughs> Listen, the gospel's not rocket science, guys. Following Jesus does not need to be made more the harder than what it is. Jesus, my allegiance is to you. You are my Lord and my Savior, my Master. You are my God, my Savior. I'm going to go where you go. I'm going to go where you lead me. Where you go, I go. It's just that simple. As he was calling these disciples, these world changers, he would change the world. Well, he called 12. He would change them with 11, which would multiply into a church, into what he would call his bride, which would change the world. Just men that, that just were going to go wherever he went and do whatever he said to do. I want to know where you're going because that's where I'm going. Are you willing to go where Jesus goes? Or are you just curious? This is where there becomes a line in the sand. Am I following Jesus out of curiosity? Or am I following him because he's Lord? Do I really have a desire to know him and to follow him? What, what here, what's called into question is my motives. My motives. 
<laughs> it's interesting. We see a lot transpired, don't we, here? A lot of, well, a lot of transpiring within my own heart to follow Jesus. There's, a, there's some decisions to be made. Part of it is, is just following Jesus half, half-heartedly or haphazardly, you know, following him in such a way that it meets my physical needs. I get what I want, you know, the possibility of blessings, prosperity, maybe heaven. I'm not so sure about this yet. I've, you, know, <laughs> you know, but I'm going to church, right? Or the other side. Well, if it's all just about election and and there's nothing I can do or say about it, well, then there's a whole lot transpiring here that's not necessary. If Jesus isn't calling my motives into question, there's some decisions to be made for you and for me. I mean, I believe wholeheartedly God is sovereign. And there is a, a, a heavenly spiritual work of election that takes place that's far above my pay grade far above my pay grade in fact within that call of election and predestination i don't see where god's asking for my two cents but what he is asking for is for my motives of heart why are you following me what do you seek who do you believe i am are you willing to go where i go Those are some deep things. All of this at the very wonderful message of John the Baptist, behold the Lamb of God, the sacrifice of God for sin. There he is. He's right there, right before your eyes. I was thinking about the call of Jesus with within these disciples. And I think that we need to hear these voices as well. The voice of Jesus, this voice with, as well in our hearts and our lives. Uh, such as the voice of Jesus there when he says to his disciples in Matthew 4, 19. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Andrew was a, also a fisherman. In Matthew eight twenty two, Jesus said to his disciples, follow me. And let the dead bury their own dead. There's a level of commitment and understanding. In Matthew 9, 9, Jesus, he saw the man named Matthew. This guy wasn't a fisherman. He was a tax collector. We don't like to pay taxes. Have you ever been audited? We were audited by this guy one time when I was in business. His name was James Brown. <laughs> I'm like, no way. This has got to be a joke, right? Seriously. It was awesome. His name was James Brown. I said, is your name really James Brown? When I fed him, yeah. It, it, we got the thing off on the right foot, so the audit went good. But anyway, he saw Matthew <laughs> sit, is sitting at the tax office, and he said to them, he said, follow me and take up and he took up his cross and he, and he followed him. W- what are you seeking? Matthew took up his cross. Do you think it was easy for him to leave that tax table? To give up everything? No. What do you seek? I, I, what, I, what I don't seek any longer is this foolish tax table. What I don't seek is the direction I've been going. The man that I've become, I, I, I seek you, is what Matthew's saying as he takes up his cross. And in Matthew 16, 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. What are you seeking? Prosperity? An easy life? 
because he tells them to deny yourself and to take up his or your cross and follow. That adds a lot to the whole question, what are you seeking? I mean, are you following Jesus? Because thus far, this is what we've read. That these two disciples, they looked, they heard, they followed, they answered Jesus. They came and they saw, they, they took action in following. And it says there that they remained with him. This is where we're at. They came and they saw where he was staying. And it says, and remained with him that day. The word here, remained, means to dwell with or to continue with someone, to not depart. In other words, they beheld this Lamb of God continually. John 8, 31 and 32 on the screen. It says, and then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. That word abide is the exact same Greek word as remained. The idea here is that they abided in him. They dwelled with him, but there was a remaining. It's now what they began to take part in his life. And, and, and the life of Christ became their life. And then here in the Gospel of John, uh, interesting there, on my page, just right at the bottom in verse 40, in one, uh, oh no, excuse, in verse 39, the bottom of 39, now it was about the 10th hour. To, to be perfectly honest with you, there's no relevance to that statement. <laughs> I mean, usually when they give a date, a month, or a time within Scripture, there's some significance, there's some relevance. I couldn't find any. Other than, this little statement has to be a clue as to who the second disciple was with Andrew. Again, I believe it's John, the author of this gospel. Because this hour, obviously, was unforgettable to the author. This moment was an unforgettable moment. Remember, the gospel of John was the last of the four gospels to be penned. When you experience God, when you encounter Jesus, it is an unforgettable moment. And that's what that statement, that's why that's there. The author is saying this was an unforgettable moment when I encountered Jesus for the first time. It changed my life. Verse 40, and one of the two who heard John, heard John say, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's what that reference is to. He heard him speak and followed him was Andrew. Andrew was, uh, here, Andrew and Peter are, are one set of two sets of brothers. We have James, the, what I'm telling you this morning is the other disciple that followed. He had a brother named James. James and John. Andrew and Peter. That's what we have here before us this morning. <clears throat> Andrew found his brother. He is the first of the disciples to tell another about Jesus. And what does he say? We found the Messiah. The gospel is not complicated. And usually, as soon as you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are encouraged by somebody, usually your counselor. I remember when I, I was a counselor at the Harvest Crusades for four or five years. And the training that we received was, now, after you've, received, you've prayed the prayer, sinner's prayer, here's your Bible, you were hooked up, here's, a ch here's how you get plugged into a church, you, know, you walk through the whole thing with them. Now you've got to go tell somebody. This is your first thing. You've got to go tell somebody somebody what you've done. Tell somebody about the decision you've made. 
What's ironic, Andrew isn't told to do, he just does it. Because it's the natural thing that happens. I've received life. I've become a born again person. I've been transformed in a moment by the words of Jesus. I gotta go tell my brother. I gotta go tell my brother. We found the Messiah. Andrew, ironically, he, he appears two more times in John's gospel. In chapter 6, 4 through 9, and in chapter 12, 20 and 22. And in both instances, he's leading somebody to Jesus. There's not much said about Andrew. But what is said is that he's a little evangelist. That not on the grand scale, maybe like Philip later would be. On a small scale, relational, one-on-one, -on -one, the way we're all called to. And he says, we found, we found, and we found the Christ. This is an Old Testament reference when he makes this statement to a, to a, 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 a modern-day Jew in that time, in that era. This is what he would have heard. We found the anointed one. Just as we read in Luke 4. He's anointed me to do what? We found that anointed one from Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. When he said we found the Messiah, that's what he's saying. We found the Christ. We found the anointed one from Isaiah 61. Can I just go over this with you for a minute? Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. He says the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he's anointed me. And then he gets into this list of work. The Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit of, the word here is Adonai. The Spirit of Adonai is, is a word, is a term referring to God that's used in place of Yahweh to display reverence. Adonai, Jehovah, is upon me. Adonai, Jehovah. The spirit of Adonai Jehovah is upon me because the Lord here, Jehovah, has applied the oil of the spirit upon me to announce salvation to the humble. When it says poor, it means humble. Ones who, who are able to listen. It doesn't mean I'm, I'm broke means I'm, I'm broke of spirit. I'm broke of character. And to firmly or securely heal the brokenhearted. One whose heart is in pieces. God has been anointed and sent. Adonai Jehovah anointed to heal your broken heart. To meet you in your humble low state. Of brokenness. One who sees their need. Ironically, we have found the Messiah, is his message. Not just another good teacher, not just a prophet, but the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And this is still how people are coming to faith in Jesus. We're still presenting in the same way. Nothing has changed. We're not adding any more to the gospel. So the question remains, who can you and I introduce to Jesus this way this week? By sharing our love and our joy and our experience with them. So he goes, and he goes to his brother. This is the first one that he finds, as if he's going to find more. He's, it's like, I'm, not just, I'm just not going to tell family. It's not that he's just concerned about family. No, his brother's the first one that he finds. His own brother, Simon, and said to him, we found the Messiah, we found the Christ. And it says he brought him to Jesus. 
You know, when you talk about Jesus, you're, not just, you're just not telling them about something they just can't see and touch. That's a, maybe that's a big problem why people, they, they don't, they don't, you have a hard time sharing your faith. It's easy when I've experienced, I've encountered Jesus myself. It's as if I'm coming, when I'm sharing my faith, I'm coming from an eyewitness experience. I've seen him. I've touched him. I've beheld his, his glory. He's changed my life. That's a message that will change somebody else's life. Not that, not that he's just, he's just, well, you know, telling him. He took him to Jesus. When you're telling somebody about Jesus, take him to Jesus. <laughs> take him to Jesus. Take him to him. Just don't refer to him. That's powerful. So he, 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 he now comes to Jesus. He, Andrew takes his brother, Pete, uh, Simon. And what does Jesus do? Right? We, we, right here within the context, we don't have uh, a lot transpired here between Peter and Jesus, just what Jesus said to Peter. As he will say to, to Nathaniel. God, remember, God knows what's in the heart of man. God knows what's in the heart of man. I don't need to know. As I'm leading somebody to Jesus, I'm bringing somebody to Christ, I don't need to know all their issues. I just need to get them to Jesus. And, and Jesus looks at, at Simon and says, you shall be called Cephas. It changes his name completely. In the Arabic, in the Aramaic, that means a stone. It, it, the name Peter is the Greek word for Cephas. The Gentile would say Peter, and the, and the Aramaic, most Jews spoke Aramaic at the time, the Hebrews, they would say Cephas. I'm going to change your name. You're going to be called a stone. Peter was transformed that very moment. Transformed into what God would call him to be. I mean, Peter would be transformed. He would be a pillar, a stone pillar within the early church. God wants to change you. God doesn't call you to himself to leave you who you are. You know that, right? I mean, what do you seek? You're not going to come to Jesus and just remain who you are. He loves you too much to do that. He's got a purpose and a plan for your life, like with Peter. And we all know a little bit about Peter. I mean, he's it, it, just, <laughs> just a normal guy. One minute he's saying something totally profound, and the next minute he's inserting foot in mouth. We can relate. Can't we? He wants to transform your life. He wants to change your name. Spiritually speaking. Let's go ahead and read down 43 through, 40, through 51. And, and then the following day, here's another day in the sequence of days within the gospel of John chapter 1. The next day. The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee. And he found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, right? A city of Andrew and Peter. But Bethsaida was um, uh, just north of where the Jordan Inlet came into Galilee, a fishing community. So, so Philip, too, is, a, is another fisherman. And he says, Follow me. 45. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and all the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. <laughs> Interesting. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? 
Philip said to him, come see. Let me tell you, oh gosh, I'm going to... Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. And Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Most assuredly I say, assuredly I say to you, Hereafter you shall see heaven open and angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Wow. The following day. Philip wastes no time either. He follows Jesus. And if we only, if we, all we had was the gospel of John here, John's gospel, one would think that this was the first time Jesus had met these men from Galilee. But Jesus had met them and called some of them in Judah. Like Andrew and what I believe is John, the author of this gospel. Jesus was here on his way north to Galilee when he called Philip to be his disciple. I've always found it interesting how and when people come to faith or encounter Jesus. I always walk away thinking, what a small world. You know, within the faith, you, you, I, I've, I've told you guys so many stories. It's like, you know, I, I was living in sin. Denise and I had an apartment. Uh, she got mad at me and she left. And then... So I'm, I'm busted up from a motorcycle accident, which is usually the story and how the story goes. And uh, so I had to move all my stuff into uh, storage. And uh, so I called my buddy with a ranchero. Who remembers a ranchero? Those are just cool. God. You know what I loved about them? The tailgate was low. <laughs> you know, a truck, you had to go. You don't call your friend with a 4x4. Four four. You call him with a ranchero. It's easy to get in. You know, I had a truck bed, big truck bed, low. So we move all this stuff in my friend Richard's ranchero. But... Uh, uh, Another friend of mine, Joe, had a guy he worked with who needed a refrigerator. And the reason why was because Joe's friend at work's wife took an ice pick at him in a fight. It was jabbing for his face. And uh, his, this guy opens the freezer door like this to protect himself. And she swings into the back of the freezer with the ice pick <laughs> and shorts the refrigerator out. So they need to buy a new refrigerator. <laughs> what they really need is to be divorced. But, but anyway, no, I'm just joking. God hates divorce. But <laughs> I mean, she's coming at you with an ice pick. <laughs> Go get a cheeseburger. Just do something. So, so this guy comes over, and I sell him this refrigerator. He didn't bring his wife, just him. Thank God. I was hoping the two wouldn't come over. So uh, they, they, they get the refrigerator out. Some years pass. Denise and I get saved. We're walking to Harvest, ninth largest church in the nation at the time. I'm in the foyer. As we're entering the foyer, I look over, and here's this guy I sold that refrigerator to, like all decked out in like a suit. Like who wears a suit to heart? He's, I mean, decked out for church. His wife got the two kids. I'm like, what the heck happened to you? I'm like, I saw so I kind of like, hey. And he looked at me and goes, hey. I, he was surprised to see me. I was surprised to see him. I'm like, what a small world. So he starts sharing with me how he got saved. And, and what's funny was, again, we kind of knew some of the same people. It's like, you know, it, it doesn't it blow your mind? The way God saves and the way God is working in our lives. Anyway, I see that here. I just, these encounters with Jesus. God involves us in these encounters. He uses us. And it just, it just blows my mind. It's such a small world, really. So, jumping down here. Philip found Nathaniel the same way that Andrew found his brother. And said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and the, all the prophets wrote about. <laughs> and then he, he finishes that with a phrase that's really unbelievable. Here's the unbelievable part. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. <laughs> he, he has to add this, I'm like, you could have done a lot better in leading somebody to Christ without saying, his name's Jesus from Nazareth. His, his dad is Joseph. You're like, don't tell him that. 
You didn't need to know. You just, you just said, this is him of whom Moses had spoken of in the law. Interesting. But this was Philip's testimony. This is what he knew to date. You know, we can share our faith and not know the whole story. All you need to know is Jesus Christ had been crucified today. And, and it's as if, well, Philip's taken just what he simply knows to be true and shares that with Nathaniel. This was his testimony. And Philip makes it a point to mention Jesus as the promised one through whom Moses had spoken of. Do you remember in John chapter, in verse 21? <clears throat> They came to Jesus, the Pharisees, and they're asking him some questions. This is one of the ones that asked him. He's, he's saying, are you, are you then, uh, are you Elijah? John the Baptist said, no. Are you, are you the prophet? He answered, no. And I, tol I told you, when they said, are you the prophet, they're referring to, are you, are you one who's coming in the power and spirit of Moses? Are you a prophet like Moses? John the Baptist said, no. But here, Philip's testimony is, this is the one that's coming in the power of Moses. As Moses, as God had promised through Moses in Deuteronomy 18, 18 and 19. Listen to what that scripture says. God speaking through, I and speaking to Moses, I will raise up for them a prophet like you, he's speaking to Moses, from among their brethren, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which, which he speaks in my name, referring to this Jesus, I will inquire it of him. <clears throat> so Nathaniel is today genuinely understood to be the same person as Bartholomew within your New Testament, one of the 12. Also a fellow fisherman. And he makes the statement, can anything good come out of Nazareth? He doesn't even pick up on this Moses bit, this reference to Deuteronomy 18. He, he just says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Coming from the wrong side of town, Jesus Remember I told you he visited home in Luke 4. And again, it didn't turn out so great. Although he was received in the synagogue, at some point, a group drug him out of the synagogue when they had heard all of his words. They were filled with wrath in Luke 4. And in Luke 4, 29, they, they, and rose up and thrust him out of the city. And they led him to a, a brow of a, the hill on which their city was built. That they might throw him down over the cliff. Then passing through the midst of them, Jesus went his way. My whole point here is that Nathaniel was right. What good can come out of Nazareth? Can I ask you something? What good can come out of you <clears throat> and part of the world that God's pulled you out of? Nothing. When I think of the community and the crowd that I ran with, someone would say, man, did you see that, Roger? I, I, I found his Facebook page. The guy's a pastor in Maricopa, Arizona. And somebody would say, are you kidding me? The Roger that I grew up with in Norco, California? Yeah, that joker. And some would say, are you kidding me? Did anything good come out of Norco during those years? I mean, we were all just a little out of control. Just a little bit. So, this is where we're at. And this is what's happening. I mean, Jesus, it appeared that he was received in the synagogue, but man, after a few more words, they wanted to throw him off a cliff. But, here's the word. Philip told Nathaniel, come see. Instead of arguing with Nathaniel, Philip just simply invites him to meet Jesus for himself. And as he's approaching Jesus, Jesus says, behold, an Israelite in whom there's no deceit. Th this was a compliment 
for Nathaniel. Jesus, knowing all that is in his heart, if I was Jesus, I'd be rebuking him, not complimenting him, if I knew what was in his heart. Jesus knows what's in your heart, too. <clears throat> and he's complimenting him. Jesus is saying, here is a true Israelite in whom there's nothing false. There's, there's nothing deceptive. He's not playing games with me. He is who he is. I like that. Let your yes be yes, your no be no. Nathaniel was sort of leaning that way. But at those words, he says to Nathaniel, to Jesus, how do you know me? Jesus says, oh, I remember when you were under the fig tree. Yep, before Philip called you to come see me. That's when I saw you. There's a whole message on what was going on under that fig tree. I believe wholeheartedly within the passage that he was contemplating and meditating on the things of God based on the very last verse of this passage in 51. I believe he was meditating, meditating on, in, out of the book of Genesis when Jacob had saw the vision of a ladder coming down and seeing angels descending and ascending to heaven. Jesus refers to that. And so here he is meditating on scripture. This was a common thing that rabbis and teachers in this day would do. They would encourage you to go find a tree and park yourself underneath it, usually a fig tree, and I want you to go meditate on the word of God. And so Nathaniel, being a good Jewish boy that he is, he's under a fig tree and he's meditating on the things of God. Philip says, you've got to come see this Jesus. Come see him for yourself. On the way, Jesus basically says, I saw you. I heard you. I know what you were meditating. I know the motives of your heart. That's why he makes this statement, in whom there's no false you know, it's okay to, to have some disagreements. It's okay to, to have some, well, some, some issues with Scripture if you're like Nathaniel. Legitimately, okay, I, I don't understand all of this exactly how it works out. And you know what? Instead of holding that in and having an attitude, you just take it to Jesus because Jesus understands. Whether, whatever he's contemplating Scripture regarding about, Jesus says, I saw you. I understood it all. We can also suppose that Nathaniel spent time in prayer as he was meditating on scriptures. I saw you praying. So this is what we can be sure of when we encounter Jesus. That is that he knows who we are. That he knows where we've been and what we've been meditating on. Turn your eyes to Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim. This is what's really happening here. And his reply is, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. This testimony regarding Jesus, the son of God, describes this unique relationship of Jesus to God the Father. King of Israel describes, you are the Messiah. You are the king. And Nathaniel, he didn't fully understand the incarnation. He didn't fully understand the Trinity. And yet, he was trusting in Psalm 2, 6 and 7, where it says, Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, You are my son. Today, I've begotten you. Nathaniel's encounter led him to proclaiming Jesus to be the son of God in his life. It's just not a theological statement. You are the son of God. To me, it's my statement. It's my profession of faith. You are the king of Israel. You are the Messiah. What are you seeking? We go right back to the beginning of this section. And then he says, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Jesus here promises Nathaniel greater signs than what he's ever seen before. He'll see heaven open. Again, a reference to Genesis 28 and Jacob's vision. The term Son of Man is profound. Have you ever said something and said, I know that was God? That wasn't me. 
This is where Nathaniel is right now as he's making this proclamation. The term, again, son of man, is referring to him being the king of glory who comes to judge the world, the son of man. This phrase, Jesus used the term son of man himself more than 80 times. Speaking of his humility, referring to his suffering, and speaking of his deity. And Jesus had said some 25 times, most assuredly, or verily, verily, I say unto you, in the Gospel of John. The question that we leave here this morning is, have you encountered Jesus? I mean, you go through scripture and, and, and see how this stuff unfolds and how it transpires. And it should change your life. This is what it means to encounter Jesus. Something's got to be said. What are you seeking? What are you after? What's your motive? We have to ask ourselves these questions. And I think that's the problem I have with, with sometimes ministers, people in general, who are a byproduct of ministries or certain specific pastors or teachers. We're all about drawing you to what we're doing. You got to come see what, what we're doing. You, you need to come and be a part of what we're doing. And, and, and I, I, I don't like that. Come be a part of what God's doing. One place he's doing something is here. It's not the only place God is moving. Come be a part of what God's doing here. Come join, if you want to be a part of what God's doing here, th that's great. Or go be a part of what God's doing over there. But regardless, you go find where God's moving and join in. Be a part of it. Experience God. Encounter Jesus. But, but don't draw people to yourself. Don't draw people to your club. Stop uh, riding some kind of theological hobby horse that, that everything about you is built around this one portion of the faith. It just, it's so, it's not going to lead anybody to Jesus. I want to bring them to Jesus. Go look how simple and yet profound this passage is. What are you seeking? Have you ever just came right out and asked somebody that? Why are you here? Do it sometime. Do it sometime. That's a great evangelistic open door. What are you about? Why are you here? Father, I just thank you for your word this morning and the power of it, and, and yet the simplicity of it. God, that it's so easy to understand and to receive, to grasp. And, and Lord, we want to understand. We want to see you, God. Lord, I, I simply, Lord, I need you. I don't need religion. I don't need to join a club. I just, I need you. And everything revolves around you. Everything else is built around you. Everything else is a, is a byproduct of you working in our lives. I ask that you would do what you do by testing the motives of our hearts from time to time. I ask, Lord, that you wouldn't be, not that you would ever be, afraid to ask the hard thing. I pray, God, that we'd be able to receive the hard question. And to give a contemplated answer. Who do we say that you are? You're not just Jesus from Nazareth. What good could come out of Nazareth? Nazareth. But, but you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. You are the lamb of God. You change a life. You make it new. You take, you take Simon and you make him Peter. When we encounter you, I pray, Lord, during this last song that if no one's ever encountered you, that they would do that, that, that your Holy Spirit 
would open them up and convict them of their need for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand. For we trust in our God and through His unfailing love we will not be shaken we will not be shaken we will not be shaken though the battle rages we will stand shine upon you and be gracious to you all week. Let's go with God, church. Let's follow him. God bless you guys.